Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to Talking Tudors, episode 42. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger. As always, I'd like to begin by thanking the wonderful patrons who continue to support this podcast. I'm so very grateful for your encouragement and generosity. A full list of patrons is available on my website under the Patrons tab. If you love Talking Tudors and would like to show your appreciation and support the work I do, just click on the Be My Patron on Podbean badge on the homepage of my website www.onthetudortrail.com or click on the Be a Patron button on the Podbean app. Join the Talking Tudors patron family and you'll be automatically entered into our patron-only monthly giveaways. August's prize is a gift voucher for Claire Ridgway's wonderful The Life of Anne Boleyn online course, valued at $75. US There's no start or end date, so it can be done at your own pace from the comfort of your own home. A huge thank you to Claire for donating this fabulous prize. Now, on to today's episode. I'm delighted that joining me on the show to talk about everyday life in Tudor London is Tony Mount. Tony is a history teacher, a writer, and an experienced public speaker. She describes herself as an enthusiastic, lifelong learner, and is a member of the Richard III Society Research Committee and a library volunteer where she leads the creative writing group. After submitting an idea for her first book about the lives of ordinary people in the Middle Ages, Everyday Life in Medieval London was published in 2014 by Amberley Publishing. The Medieval Housewife was published in November 2014, and Dragon's Blood and Willow Bark, The Mysteries of Medieval Medicine, was first released in May 2015. A Year in the Life of Medieval England followed in 2016 and will be relaunched in paperback in October this year. Tony has also created a range of online history courses for MedievalCourses.com and is the author of a series of fiction books. My conversation with Tony straight after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sales. Welcome to Talking Tudors, Tony. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, Natalie. Very happy to talk to you this morning. Wonderful. Now, Tony, I thought we could begin by you just introducing yourself to our listeners and telling us a little bit about your background. Right. Well, at present, I'm an author. I have uh, nine novels to my credit. Amazing. And about, <laughs> and about eight factual books so which we're still working on um but i began as um in medical research i moved into history did a teaching qualification and i haven't looked back since 
months, really. So I've got a very wide range of interests, so from science to history to uh, sociology. So wonderful, yep. excellent. And when did your interest in the Tudor period begin? Well, it kind of followed on from my first big interest, which was medieval. But unlike a lot of people who think medieval stopped when Richard III was killed at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485, I don't think the medieval ended there at all. Because though we have change of dynasty from Plantagenets to Tudors, for society very little changed that. Day. I think the real um, cut-off for medieval begins in the 1530s when Henry VIII began to close down the monasteries. Uh, they had been society's welfare system and losing those really did have a big effect on society. And I was fascinated to explore that change so that was really where my interest in Tudors took off. Yes, it's great that you bring that up because it obviously wasn't an overnight shift, was it, from medieval to early modern England. It was, you know, it took decades, as you say. Um, so that's a great point to make. Now, Tony, your first book, Everyday Life in Medieval London, was published in 2014. So have you always had an interest in the lives of ordinary people? Yes, um, I think like most um, casual historians. I started out with kings and queens because kings and queens are easier to find out about. There's plenty of biographies and every history book mentions them. But um, I was always interested in what life was like for ordinary people. And through the 1990s, I took part in what was called the Wills Project for the Richard III Society. Uh, this was based on one particular volume at the um, Canterbury, the Canterbury Cathedral Archives which literally contains copies of everybody's will that was registered there. We started with a particular will that each volume is named after the first will in it. And we worked through the log volume, that's L-O-G-G-E, and it covered the reign of Richard III. That was supposed to be the Society's Millennium Project. But I soon realised that wills were a wonderful window on the lives of ordinary people. So um, that was um, my way in, if you like, to looking at ordinary lives. Okay, and let's talk a little bit about Tudor London. So what was the city like? Well, Tudor times, um, I think London was probably at its most crowded. The reason for that was that it was still stuffed within the walls of London, the original city square mile. In medieval times, from 1348 onward, the population of England had crashed with the Black Death. And because the Black Death never really went away, the population didn't really recover too well. But they were, uh, London population was kept up mostly by people moving in from the countryside. So London was becoming more and more crowded, partly because landowners in the country were beginning to enclose their land. Now, I don't know what you know about enclosures, but the idea was that you could run thousands of sheep with just a couple of people to look after them and make far more money from sheep's wool than you could from growing crops, 
which also required a much larger workforce. So landowners realised they could get rich on sheep and they needed fewer work people in the countryside. So all the unemployed were migrating to London in Tudor times. That meant that what had been a very nice family house back in medieval times, was now being divided up into multiple tenancies. And where there had been gardens, these were being built on. So London was getting far and far more crowded. Also, the streets were becoming narrower because people added extra upper stories to their houses so that they could rent them out to these new people coming in. And each story jetted out over the one below. Um, That meant that each story got bigger, but you only paid the ground rent for the size of the bottom story. So it was another con. But that meant that houses were leaning out over the streets and making them darker. There was no sanitation much to speak of. It was very noisy as well because nobody had a watch and they relied on church bells to tell the time. They marked gate opening times for the city, market hours, curfew times. One interesting little point is there were numerous markets throughout London and each had a bell to know when it began trading. And if you traded before the bell opened, that sorry, before the bell rang, that was called forestalling. In other words, you were jumping the bell. Right. <laughs> and that was illegal. You could be fined heavily for that. Which I think brings us on to your next question, which was about Food. Yes, food, um, obviously. Yeah. Where, where you would buy it. That's right. Right. Well, there were a number of big markets. There was a whole of Cheapside, which was a very long street full of shops of all kinds. It ran east west across London and was London's high street. But there was also Leadenhall, which uh, was almost as shopping mall uh, with indoor shops and things like that. Um, But if you were in London, you could virtually do your shopping by knowing the names of the streets. At one end of Cheapside, there's poultry, which was where you go to buy your chickens, geese, duck, partridges. Um, So you start in the east of Cheapside in poultry to buy your uh, chickens. Then you move along through Cheapside. There are grocery shops and uh, mercery shops which sold fighting clock. Um, Then you had places like Bread Street, Milk Street, Fish Street, which um, showed where you could go to buy the produce you needed. But there were laws in London, particularly for the sale of bread and ale. There were, these were called the laws of a size and were supposed to stop dodgy practices. There's one story about an ale wife whose house caught fire and she Pray to God, please, to put the fire out before she lost her livelihood. Because she was an honest ale wife and she put all her ale measuring cups out in the street so God could see them. And this was supposed to prove she was selling proper full measures of ale. And God sent a cloud and it rained on her house and put the fire out. That wasn't the miracle. The miracle was reckoned to be an alewife who was honest. Right. In- <laughs> I see, okay. And yeah, there were also cons yes. about bread if we've got time to talk about them. Yes, yeah. For example, 
bakers in London had um, a monopoly on baking bread. You could make your own bread, but you had to take it to bakers to be baked. Um, the reason for that was fire hazards. Now, the story goes that in conjunction with the carpenters, the bakers had made up these special kneading tables. And the customer would take along their dough and the baker would say, right, I'll just give it one last little knead and then we'll put it in the oven. But the table had a trap door in the middle of it an apprentice would be hiding under the table and he would open the trap door and pinch a handful of the dough <laughs> even as the customer looked and both the bakers and the carpenters were prosecuted for that um, there were also a group of Baxters, now Baxters are female bakers working in Shoreditch and it seems that a whole group of them have got together as a cooperative because they were all prosecuted together for selling underweight loaves. And what they were obliged to do was instead of a dozen loaves, they had to put in one extra to make up the weight, which leads to 13 Right. Known as bakers, How fascinating. That's so interesting. Now, you mentioned, obviously, that there were women bakers. What other employment opportunities were there for women in Tudor London? Well, not so much, unfortunately. In Tudor times, women's opportunities were diminishing. Back in medieval times, women had done just about every job from delicate silk working to blacksmithing, um, tailoring to bell casting. Uh, in Whitechapel, there were two famous women who made the bells, some of which are still ringing in churches today. Mm. But this influx of people from the countryside into London meant that um, there was mass unemployment. And it was thought vital that the breadwinner of the family, in other words, the man, must have a job if there was a job at all. So, Tudor legislation banned craftsmen from employing any women as cheap labour. They always paid women less than men. And only their wives were allowed to work for them. So that was really beginning to reduce um, women's opportunities. Throughout the medieval period, ale production had gone on on a sort of household scale with the woman brewing ale for the family. But around the 1490s, hops were coming in. Now, if you add hops to ale, it lasts a much longer time. It becomes beer. Ale will last a week at the most. Beer will last almost indefinitely if kept in a barrel. So suddenly, instead of just brewing enough for the household, you could brew vast amounts and it became industrialised and men ran the brewing business uh, with massive breweries setting up in London. So all those kind of things were happening and actually reducing women's opportunities from what they had been. Well, let's talk about children because we don't we don't often hear about the lives, well, not, not as much as that of adults, I guess, of the lives of children in the 16th century. So what was it like for children living in Tudor London? Well, you weren't a child for very long. No, that's true, so, yeah. Um, you were considered an innocent infant from naught to seven. You then became a child from 7 to 14, but a 12 years old girl could marry. Boys, was, it was 14, 
So the ages really apply to boys. At 14, you could become an apprentice and you were known as a youth, which would be the case until you were 21 when you became an adult. But as soon as they could walk and understand instructions, children would be given jobs to do. And a good source of finding out what these jobs were are the coroner's roles. When the children's job went wrong and they died as a result. And from this you discover that little girls were helping in the house. They um, were fetching water from the well and falling in. They were catching their clothes on fire, cooking. They were getting scalded with hot water and soup and things like that. Whereas the boys tend to have uh, farming accidents uh, where they're helping out with the um, axes and plows and various other sharp instruments and come to grief. So we do know that work to bring in an income for the family was rather more important than education. Unfortunately, also, it was expected that parents would punish their children and that meant a slap or a beating because it was the only way to force children to learn good behaviour and a parent was thought to be failing if they didn't do this. I would just mention a couple of words that we often associate with children which meant something very different in Jude times. You would never call a child naughty. The word naughty means naught less than human and was generally a term applied to murderers. So you wouldn't say a naughty child. Right, okay. Not let's kill someone. Yeah. And silly was definitely a term applied to children, but it didn't mean that they were daft. It meant they were innocent. So silly children were right, innocent. Okay. That's really interesting because I see the word naughty come up a lot in um, the state papers just referring to, yeah, criminals a lot of the time. So that's really, it's a great point that you make there. Now, Tony, it's, I think it's difficult for many of us nowadays to, to understand the critical role that religion played in the lives of people in the 16th century. You know, it dictated the rhythm of life. And, and could you talk to us about how religion affected everyday life in sort of practical, practical ways? Well, religion was everything. You were expected to wake up in the morning and the first thing you did was say prayers. You ate your breakfast if it was a fast day, which was every Wednesday, every Friday, and in the reign of Henry VIII, every Saturday as well. Then you would not eat meat. You would be expected to eat fish instead. Henry VIII introduced Saturday fasting because there's a port on the northeast coast of England called Grimsby and its herring fleets were bringing in so much fish they really couldn't sell it all. So Henry made Saturday a fish day to help use up their excess. So um, diet was affected definitely by religion. Throughout Lent, there was uh, no meat and no dairy products. So again, it would have to be just fish or vegetarian stuff, I suppose. Advent, that's 30 days before Christmas, again, there was very little meat to be eaten. Of course, it was religion which gave us holidays, which were originally holy days. And fortunately for Tudor people, at least until the um, dissolution of the monasteries, there were a lot more holidays than we have now. Saints' days would be celebrated. Various feast days would all be holidays. Um, Plus a few 
pagan festivals as well, like May Day was always a holiday. So um, it also affected what you wore. Um, There was this crazy idea that in the Garden of Eden, Eve had tempted Adam to sin, not by offering him a juicy apple, but because of her beautiful, long, blonde hair. They always insisted it was blonde. (laughs) And she led him astray. So it was the rule that respectable married women had to keep their hair covered at all times so that only their husband could appreciate it. So maidens could show their hair because they were on the lookout for a husband. (laughs) But once you got your husband, you had to cover your hair. Unfortunately, religion also had drastic rules about sex. You could not have sex on a religious festival day. You could not have sex on the day before a religious festival day. So every week, Sunday was out. Sunday was the Lord's Day. And Saturday night was also out because you were supposed to be praying and thinking about Sunday. There was no sex in Lent, no sex in Advent, No sex on Wednesdays or Fridays. Uh, So really, Monday, Tuesday and Thursday were the only possible days. (laughs) But then if a woman was menstruating, it was right out. If she was already pregnant, it wasn't allowed because the whole point of sex was to create a child. So if you'd already done that, you didn't need to. Also, a breastfeeding mother could not have sex because it was thought to taint her milk. Um, So really, it's a wonder mankind didn't go into it. (laughs) I can only think that people ignore them. Yes, I think so. (laughs) Very true. Um, And to um, go back to the... uh, dissolution of the monasteries um, that really did change a lot of these things because it did away with a lot of the religious festivals when um, prayer to individual saints became idolatry you could only pray to um, God and Jesus Christ praying to anyone else was not allowed But the um, closing of the monasteries, as I mentioned earlier, destroyed what we would call the welfare of the country. Hospitals were always attached to monasteries, so they were closed down. Beggars could not go begging at the door where they were obliged to give you bread and ale enough for a day. They also did various other charitable acts. So it was um, really down to the Tudors replacing all this eventually with the poor law, which some popular, because it was run at parish level, so poor parishes couldn't afford it. Um, Any wealthy people begrudged being told how much they had to give, and the poor felt humiliated with what they had to go through to receive it. And of course, the monastery had also been in charge of education. So that was the real big change in the 1530s, 40s and after that. All right, thank you. Now, you've also written a book about medieval housewives. So what were some of the main duties of a medieval or a Tudor housewife? Well, it all came down really to number one rule, take care of your husband. Right, yes. Um, there's, there's a great book actually written in the 1390s, but um, what it told, believe it or not, crops up almost word for word in a school textbook from the 1950s. Goodness. 
Okay. <laughs> yes. After the Second World War, women have got a taste of uh, freedom. Mm. Um, during the Second World War, taking over the jobs of men, and the um, idea was that this would reinstate the little woman at the kitchen sink in the 1950s, and the rules are virtually the same. You've got to make your home comfortable, welcoming, good food, keep it clean and tidy for him. One thing it says is when he comes in the front door, wash his feet for him, give him uh, clean socks and shoes and let him sit by the hearth and then you serve him with food and drink. Even things like the woman herself dressing well was not for her benefit. It was to show that her husband provided for her um, to a suitable standard. And if the house looked nice, it wasn't a reflection on her hard work, but on how well her husband instructed her in keeping it neat so that was the thing everything came down to making sure that husband was uh, treated in the manner to which he would like to be accustomed I suppose that's still true today (laughs) yes I do love those early housekeeping um, books they're really quite fascinating quite interesting so you mentioned that obviously part of that duty was to keep your house and your family obviously clean and, and looking respectable. So how, how did the women keep their houses clean? Obviously, there's no spray and, you know, sprays to use or this or that. So how did, how did they do that, Tony? Well, it was basically down to sweeping, scrubbing, mm. um, everything very labour intensive. Um, they could actually tell a housewife's skeleton by the state of the bones in her knees wow, and hips because they spent so long on their knees scrubbing floors um, and in the earlier times also working at a quernstone to grind corn. So housework has always shown up in women's skeletons. There were things to help. There were herbs such as flea bane which grows like weed in this country and you could put that around to deter fleas and um, they had this wonderful idea for keeping moths out of woolen clothing because moths will just ruin them but they thought that the smell of ammonia from the toilet would get rid of the moths a medieval indoor toilet was called a guardrobe, and it's actually the same word as wardrobe. It means exactly the same place where you guard your robes. Yes, so um, I have visions of Saturday night, everyone getting their Sunday best out of the toilet. Yes. <laughs> Um, you know, a lot of sprinkling of lavender water and rose water, <laughs> shaking and that. But um, I I do wonder what it smelled like in church on a hot Sunday Ooh, morning. Oh, yes. Oh. Um, which might explain why priests liked burn incense. <laughs> it might true. well have improved the smell of the congregation as well as wafting prayers heavenwards. So um, they were also surprisingly clean. It's um, later centuries that people got really, really smelly. But early Tudor times, they were still bathing as often as they could. Although medical people said bathing was bad for you, and gradually that be caught on more and more. But they would change their undergarments as frequently as possible. So they did try to stay clean. And, of course, hand washing was vital before, during and after a meal because they weren't using forks, so it was all fingers. So um, it was vital to have clean hands, not because they knew about germs, but because you shared dishes with other people 
and they did not want your sweaty fingers yeah. on them. they were going to eat. Let's talk about food a little bit more. Obviously, another one of the um, housewife's main role that you mentioned was to, to make sure there's good food for the husband and, you know, the family. So what food would we expect to find on the table of a working class family, for example? Uh, well, two staples, bread and ale. Now, no potatoes, even though Sir Walter Rock is supposed to have brought them back to England in the reign of Queen Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth is supposed to have tried a potato, thought it didn't taste of anything very much, <laughs> didn't catch on with her, so it didn't catch on with anybody else. And even if it had, it was an imported luxury. So, John Smith would not have had potatoes so it was bread with everything now really poor people would have dark bread what we call wholemeal bread with right. everything in it posh people had white wheat bread which had been sieved numerous times to get rid of uh, all the uh, bits that make it wholemeal now there was um, an outcry quite early on in the Middle Ages, sort of from the 14th century, that poor men said they wanted white bread like the Lord. And the Lord said, no, you need brown bread because it gives you more energy and you need energy to work my land. And people would say, well, why don't you eat it as well? And his lordship would say, well, because it makes you fart. Right. And that's not what a lord should be uh, doing. So um, bread that makes you fart was fine for poor people. But they all wanted white bread. Cabbages and most root vegetables that we know of was what lower class people would eat. And it would all go into a pot thickened with oats so it would end up looking a bit like porridge right. and in fact the word was pottage from which we've corrupted porridge so it could have anything in it any scraps of meat, scraps of fish, any bits of vegetables, anything to give it a taste now once again slightly richer people preferred to thicken their pottage with wheat and it was called frumenti so posher people had frumenti everybody thought that uncooked fruit was bad for you although they do seem to have liked eating fresh cherries and strawberries but they were bad for you it was a, a fact I suppose if you ate a glut of strawberries all at once, maybe they did seem to be bad for you. Um, but raw vegetables were also bad for you. Salad was more to be looked at than eaten. And salad had interesting ingredients. It was more herbs and flowers. Uh, tomatoes, like potatoes, come from the New World. So they wouldn't have had those. And anyway, they were regarded as very dodgy, like potatoes. Because if you've ever looked at the flowers of potatoes and tomatoes, the flowers show they belong to the nightshade family of poisonous plants. And both plants are poisonous. That's why you don't eat potatoes raw, they have to be cooked. And although we can eat tomatoes, the rest of the plant is poisonous. So their salads would consist of dandelion leaves and, depending on the season, primroses and violets or rose petals and meadow sweet flowers, marigolds, all sorts of things. They were all edible flowers. So quite nice. They did have lettuce, but lettuce was a medicine. Lettuce apparently sends you to sleep. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it was used in the medical profession rather than as a salad. Now, for the very poor, cheese was a 
their main protein. But when you make, when they made cheese, the first cheese they made would be made with whole milk, with the cream as well. And it would be a soft cheese, a bit like cottage cheese or cream cheese. And that would go to his lordship. You would sell that if you lived in town and made cheese. The cheese, the soft cheeses would fetch a good price. With what was left of the milk, it would now be the equivalent of skimmed milk. So very little fat content. So when you make cheese with that, it comes out like concrete, lots of salt in it, and those two things means it keeps very well. So, so indefinitely, in fact, that I've come across a couple of wills of farmers who bequeath the cheeses to the next generation. Right, okay. That's how well they kept. <gasps> wow. But you know, You've literally had to um, chop up the cheese and soak it in order to be able to get your teeth in it. So really, really hard cheese. (laughs) And that's actually where, in England, if we say hard cheese to someone, we mean bad luck. But um, no, hard cheese goes right back to the days when that was all poor people had. They would eat meat very rarely. Lamb, never. That was for rich people on mm-hmm. Easter Sunday only. Because to kill a lamb was a waste of all the years of fleece you could get off it. Quite often, poor people did keep a pig. They would buy a little piglet for a penny in the spring and feed it up on scraps or let it forage for itself and then kill it at Martin Mass um, on the 11th of November. So from that they'd make pork, ham, sausages, black pudding, pig's trotters plus pork cuts. But it was better to sell most of them and then use the money to buy um, less expensive cuts of meat or things to keep you going through the winter. Same with chicken and mutton. Chickens were for laying eggs and it was only when they got too scrawny to lay that you kill them off and eat them. And the same with mutton. If the animal died of old age then you might boil it up in the pot. But of course none of this meat was uh, choice. Mm, Yes, doesn't sound very tasty. (laughs) Now, (laughs) Now, Tony, whenever we kind of speak, you know, on social media about life in in everyday life in in 16th century England, people are always so interested to hear about childbirth and what that experience was like for women. So could you talk to us a little bit about what childbirth was like, not for noble women, but for everyday women? Dangerous. Yes. Dangerous for everyone. You asked how they knew um, they were pregnant. Well, there was no definite um, test for it. Some of the medical books say that a woman's urine changes colour, that if it's very pale, she's probably pregnant. But your urine changes colour anyway, depending on how hydrated you are. So, So there really wasn't a way to tell until the woman felt the child move. Periods for us are if they stop, it's a good sign that we're pregnant. But back in those days, the diet they were eating was often iron deficient, which meant that they probably didn't have regular periods anyway. And that meant led to um, iron deficiency and uh, anemia, which could make blood loss during childbirth even more dangerous for them and of course uh, there were no anaesthetics <laughs> not not for women anyway there were surgical anaesthetics but the church believed that a woman had to suffer that was Eve's legacy for her sin in the garden of Eden the bible says that a woman will bring forth a child 
in pain. So they had to suffer that. Even in Queen Victoria's day, they still believed that. Although Victoria apparently had chloroform when her fifth child was born. And although the Archbishop of Canterbury said she didn't ought to have done, it soon caught on. But up until then, they were supposed to uh, suffer. It was what women did. There was an old wives' tale, tale which uh, I know still exists, of dangling a needle or a wedding ring on a thread over the woman's pregnant belly. Yes, people still do that today, don't they? Yeah, I know that. Yeah, well, again, that goes right the way back. If it <laughs> swings to and fro, it's supposed to be a boy. Mm-hmm. If it goes in a circle, it's supposed to be a girl. Now, the was Good news in the ideas of sex and getting pregnant for women. And that was that they had to enjoy sex because they thought, rather like a man's ejaculation, a woman did the same inside. Mm -hmm. And in order to release her seed, she had to have an orgasm in order to get pregnant. So this meant marital relations for a woman could be absolutely great. Unfortunately, if she got pregnant as a result of rape, well, it couldn't have been rape because she must have enjoyed it. Mm, I see, yeah. Uh, Yeah, and in fact, um, recently in America, there's some crazy senator who argued against free abortion for rape victims for that very reason. He was still claiming that if they got pregnant, they must have enjoyed it. The same went for prostitutes. If they got pregnant, well, it was all their own fault because they were obviously enjoying their work too much. So... um, you enjoy what you're doing and get pregnant, that's your fault. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, midwives knew a lot more about what was going on than doctors, but um, the stress on midwives was that they had to be respectable Christian women because it was the only event where a woman might usurp the role of a priest in that midwives could baptise a child if it wasn't going to last long enough for a proper christening. So midwives could baptise babies. I would like just to say here that every occasion of childbirth, a woman would call in all her female relatives and friends to give her comfort and support. And, of course, the wait for the arrival of the baby might well be quite lengthy. So these women used to sit around and chat and got bored. And the chat might degrade into rumour, which might degrade into um, false information. Now, these women were called gossips. So that's where our word gossip for the uh, rumour mill yeah. <laughs> actually comes from. So I hope that answers uh, some of those questions. Yeah, thank you. It's so interesting. Now, um, Tony, you've spent years researching the lives of ordinary people in 15th and 16th century England. Have you ever come across anything that really surprised you or that made made you question, you know, previously held beliefs about how people lived at this time? Well, there's a couple of things. Back in 2012, at a castle in Austria, they found linen rags which had been holding up a 15th century floor and blocking out the drafts and that. And in amongst them, they found linen bras and ladies' pants. So it had always been thought women only wore a shift. That's right. Never bras and pants. But there they were. So that was one wonderful surprise. Um, Another one, and this time it's to do with sex, was a guy called John Reichner. Now, he used to go around London dressed as a woman 
and calling himself Ellen and offering his services. Um, he was actually caught by the watch in a stable with a man right, okay. and they arrested the pair of them. Now, interestingly, there were no laws against homosexuality in the 15th century. So they didn't know what to accuse John Reichner of. In the end, they accused him of offering for sale services which he could not provide. Right, okay. The words of women's services. So it's kind of doing it under the Trades Descriptions Act. But of course, in Tudor times, in 1533, Henry VIII introduced an act against buggery and sodomy, is what it's called on the statute books. Um, and what John Wright can have been doing suddenly became a capital offence that he could have been hanged for it. Um, so that was a bit of a shock. <laughs> yes, thank you. Now, apart from writing lots of wonderful non-fiction books, you're currently, as you mentioned, working on your ninth novel. Now, can you tell us about your Sebastian Foxley murder mystery series? Well, I'd love to, yes. Um, Sebastian Foxley began life as an open university creative writing course. Oh, okay. Um, uh, essay. You had to um, plan a novel. Didn't matter whether you were ever going to write it. But I came up with, I wanted someone who could, if you like, be a Sherlock Holmes of the 15th century to solve crimes that nobody else could manage. And I thought an artist with his eye for detail would be a good sleuth. So that was how Sebastian Foxley um, emerged. He is an illuminator of manuscripts and lives in London. The books are set so far in the 1470s. And uh, Sebastian, you've got to feel sorry for him. Married the girl of his dreams, but... Um, She's gone off him. So oh, marriage was a... <laughs> Yes, well, she thought she loved him, but it was just uh, a, a young girl's thing. Um, and it didn't turn out to be quite the man she fancied. Um, so The Colour of Poison was the first one in which Seb, as we call him, uh, worked out that his master had been poisoned by the yellow pigment or pigment, which contains arsenic. Um, and he works that out. That's where he really gets to know Emily. They get married in the colour of gold, which was really only meant to be an online short story. But uh, my publisher turned it into a short book. Um, they did then go on to a full novel called The Colour of Cold Blood. They're all called The Colour of Something right, okay. because of its artist's interests. Cold Blood, there's a new man on the scene called Gabriel, whom Emily falls for. And that uh, really spells doom for their marriage. Then The Colour of Betrayal is a novella set at Christmas. So again, of course, it's a murder, but I had a lovely time discussing all the uh, preparations for Christmas. Oh, and how wonderful. The meal and the games. And so the murder sort of got a, a nice festive background. Right. <laughs> well, the next one was The Colour of Murder, which solves that um, old chestnut. How did the Duke of Clarence die. Did oh. he drown in the butt of bombs he wanted? Well, that's all solved by Seb. And there have been a couple more since then. Wonderful. And when's yes. the new one coming out? Well, the last one, The Colour of Lies, came out in the end of April. Oh, end of April. Okay. So um, 
there's also supposed to be um, a big collector's edition containing the first two books and a lot of background and all sorts of extras coming out in September. And I'm currently working on The Colour of Shadows, which is going to take place in the uh, murky Southwark side of London Bridge where all the brothels and that work. So a new world for Seb who's a bit of an innocent. Right, fantastic. I don't know how you do it all, Tony. That's amazing. (laughs) So, ten to go. (laughs) Fantastic. (laughs) Love it. All right, now, Tony, that you've shared so many wonderful insights, but it's time to start wrapping our episode up. And what we like to do towards the end of all our Talking Tutors episodes is play a little game of ten to go. So this is just... 10 questions just to get to know you a little bit um, better. So are you ready to play? Yes. Excellent. So what's um, one of your favourite Tudor locations to visit? Has to be Heaver Castle. Oh, beautiful. Where um, Anne Boleyn um, lived. Uh, It's not far from where we live. So, uh, yeah, great place. Oh, you're lucky to live close to Heaver. How wonderful. Very lucky. Now, what is one of your favourite holiday destinations? Well, we went to Venice last year. Oh, That was rather wonderful. And uh, also went to Ravenna, which is on the east coast of Italy. Well worth it for the fabulous mosaics dating back to the 6th and 7th century in their churches. Amazing. Now, Is there a new skill that you would like to learn? Um, I'd love to be better at Latin. Oh, yes. Um, I can manage graveyard Latin. Okay. um, But despite um, Latin O level, doing Latin at Open University and passing and Latin from the National Archives. I still can't do Latin. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I think there's lots of us that would like to improve there. Um, What's the last book that you read, or perhaps that you're currently reading something? Something entirely different. Um, I've just finished a Clive Cussler thriller. Oh, okay, yes. His Isaac Bell series are set early in the 1900s in America. They're quite good. Yeah, my husband's a Clive Cussler fan, but I, I have to say I've never read any any Clive Cussler, but I hear that they're very entertaining, definitely. Yes. Okay, so uh, what's a favourite Tudor film that you've, maybe a Tudor film or a series that you've watched and enjoyed? Well, I always laugh at the Charles Lawton film. <laughs> I really hate. That is so over the top. And his manners are so atrocious, which of Henry VIII would not have been. Henry was raised a gentleman. There's no way he would have chewed chicken off yes. the bone. Off the bone that, no. that is very entertaining, <laughs> so though, isn't it? For a lot of fun, yes. Definitely. And what's um, some music? What kind of music do you like to listen to? Well, I do like medieval and Tudor music. Yeah, um, me too especially sort of lute music. But otherwise, I'm pretty old-fashioned, Handel and Mozart. But um, I also like Queen. That's They're great. from my era. I've, I've lost touch with pop music <laughs> since the 1980s. So I don't know any modern groups. <laughs> That's all right. And what's something you do to relax? Read. Yes. Definitely read, yes. Um, I find having a shower is the best place to work out what Seb Foxley's next uh, next adventure is going right. to be. I yeah. do have some very long, long showers. Long showers, I was going to oh, say. Yeah. And it's difficult to take notes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's true. Apart from your love of history, what's something else that brings you joy? Wildlife. Right, yeah. And uh, we've got a garden that part of it is beautiful garden, but part of it is wildlife garden. We have lots of birds and butterflies and foxes and squirrels. And, oh, that yeah, sounds lovely. 
Yeah, that sounds really nice. And lucky last, uh, what advice would you give to any of our listeners who are hoping to maybe write a novel themselves? Don't try to follow a trend. Yeah. Don't try to be Philippa Gregory yes. or <laughs> anything like that because that's been done. Be yourself and write the book you would enjoy reading and the chances are other people would enjoy it too. Yeah, that's such great advice. That's what I always keep in my mind, doing things because you love them rather than for any other reason. That's great advice. Now, yeah, the your very... enthusiasm will show. Exactly. <laughs> I think that's very true. Now, the last thing we do, Tony, is our Tudor takeaway. So I ask guests just to give us something that our listeners can have a look at or listen or watch after the episode. So do you have a Tudor takeaway for us? Yes, the ballad of the tyrannical husband. Oh, I'm uh, just that just type that in Google, okay. and various versions will come up. Um, it was written as a song. It's um, a long song. It's supposed to be um, a ballad singer would sing it in the tavern, and it actually includes his pauses for a. Another glass of ale. No. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the story of a farmer and his wife. And the farmer goes off and plows the field and comes back and complains because his wife hasn't got the dinner ready. Right. So she goes through, she did this, that, the other, 50 jobs, looked after the children, blah, 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 blah. So... The um, husband suggests that tomorrow they swap places. She can go and plough the field, <laughs> which is far harder work, and he'll stay at home and put his feet up because it's all <laughs> Um Unfortunately, the end of the ballad is missing. Don't know the outcome, <laughs> but if you want to look at life of a poor farmer's wife, that's the way to go. The Ballad of the Tyrannical Husband. Love it. I'm there, going to look that up, are, definitely. <laughs> yeah, there are sort of um, Middle English and modern versions okay. of it. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Thank you. That's the first time anyone's shared that to you to take away. So thank you, Tony. And thank you so much for taking the time to talk Tudors with us. My pleasure. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website www.onthetudortrail.com where you will also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family and click on the all important follow button so you'll never miss an episode. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind the scenes news. It's time now for us to re enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.